<laughs> well, the Mi 24P Hind is finally here. And it's a beauty. But today, we're going to look at all the things that are wrong with it. All the things that are missing, unfinished, broken, or just otherwise disappointing. But before we get started, I wanted to confirm that yes, I do plan a full tutorial series for the Mi 24. However, I can't make any promises for timeline, as much of my research will depend on the completed manual being delivered by Eagle Dynamics at some point later in early access. Until then, I will do my best, and if there's a, any particular tutorial that you'd like me to focus on sooner rather than later, please let me know in the comments below, and I'll see what I can do. And now, for the next 30 minutes, I will tell you all my frustrations with the Mi 24P Hind helicopter. Why would you do that? So why am I making this video? Well, simply put, because this is the kind of information that I'd like to have when making my purchase decision. If you can tell me everything that's wrong with your product and I'm still interested in buying it, well then I'm probably going to be pretty happy with it when I do. Now ultimately I'm going to find out what's wrong with the module when I buy it anyway, but I'm going to be a whole lot happier and more forgiving of issues if you've been upfront about them and there aren't that many surprises. The whole business model for DCS is repeat purchases. We are a niche community, a small community, and Eagle Dynamics relies on building up trust and getting multiple purchases over time. They need to have those good releases. Unfortunately for Eagle Dynamics, the last aircraft they released with a pre-order period was the F-16 Viper, and that didn't go so well. With that release, we got almost no information prior to the launch day, and then we found out the hard way that it lacked basic functionality like external lights, a damage model, and the ability to interrogate friend or foe. So you can imagine that when I saw the published list of known issues for the Hind on release day, and it included these items, well... <laughs> now, I'm happy to report that the Hind is not another F-16, and in fact the launch has been pretty smooth, all things considered. But it would have been nice if this list had been published before the 30% pre-order discount ended, so that we had that information while we could still get the best possible price for the module. Now, I was also somewhat curious, how complete is this list? How significant are the bugs that are on it? And what other bugs might exist that aren't in the list, whether known or not? So let's go take a look at some of the things I found to be significant. You're my friends now. We're having soft tacos later. So naturally, the most critical bug in the hind is the one that affects the most critical feature. The beautiful fan that utilizes the World War II prop physics up there, that Edie's even gone to the trouble of letting you do this. And if you've got VR, you can stick your finger in there and do the same thing. However, it's an absolute tragedy that this doesn't work in the front seat. So, Eagle Dynamics, I'm gonna need you to get on that. So, moving on to the uh, lesser items, the top of my list is multiplayer desync. Now this did get a one-liner item in the patch notes and they mentioned that doors and lights may not sync. And while that's true, 50% of the hinds I've encountered, whether my own or someone else's, have the operator's hatch permanently stuck open, there are other things that I think are a little more significant that also get desynced and are a little more impactful. So for example, my first time attempting multi-crew with Ravage Talon, uh, he sat in the back seat, and according to his game, uh, engine RPM, rotor RPM were all up and running, generators were on, systems were powered, but sitting in the front seat, I was still looking at 60% RPM, and I couldn't turn anything on because as far as my game was concerned, I didn't have the RPM to run the generators. Now we worked around that by simply passing the controls to me, so I could roll the throttle up manually and then pass it back to him, and that got everything back in sync. But there's also stuff that's been reported like the gear position not being synced. And so one pilot lands and then passes the controls back to the other pilot. But because the second pilot doesn't know the gear is supposed to be extended, the helicopter drops or explodes, which is not great. There's also many reports of things like the ATGMs not being synced properly. And so the workaround is to have the um, pilot operator load them and then have the pilot commander load anything else he may want to take along. And there are a number of other things reported where 
there are workarounds to make things operate correctly, but it's a bit of a pain in the ass. And a lot of the time it just requires the operator to slot out and slot back in to try to reset things, which is kind of a pain. So one fun thing that isn't fixed by simply reslotting the operator is the countermeasures panel. As you can see, it's up here in the front cockpit with the operator, but if the operator uses it in multiplayer, it really isn't visible and has no impact on any other players or missiles on the server. So it doesn't do you any good. So if you want to use countermeasures in multiplayer, you need to have the pilot do it from the back seat, the pilot commander, using the pilot launch snars binding from the menu. Uh, and that'll dispense chaff and flare that other players and missiles on the server can actually see. Now I can't remember for sure, but the pilot commander in the back might also have to configure the panel using bindings because they can't see the panel. So pilots, get out your grabber arms, you're gonna need them. So if you're someone who purchased or is thinking about purchasing this module exclusively for multi-crew play, you might want to hold off, and if you're Eagle Dynamics, I would encourage you to focus on this one probably before the other stuff. The next one is the state of the bindings menu for the hind. It's uh, not great. So if you were to go right now to your bindings menu and try to bind something for the pilot site or the adjustments for the moving map or the APU start and stop or anything related to sling loading, for example, you won't find it. It's just not there. Uh, it's not a huge deal that these bindings don't exist, and I mean, we can be pretty confident that they're coming, but for the moment, it's kind of a pain in the ass. And in fact, I had no idea that this, this helicopter could even sling load right now. I thought that was a feature to be delivered later because there are no bindings for it until I saw Captain Steinch do it in his training mission video and realized that it can. You just have to flip the switches yourself. So that's kind of an issue. Uh, and it's not just stuff that's missing, but also things like you can't bind the countermeasure discrete sets, one, two, and three. You can only advance to the next one. So you can't, you in the backseat anyway, have no indication of what state it's in. You can't choose directly. Uh, and then you have stuff where you've got a toggle, but you really would like to ha also have an up and a down separate, like the gear lock or the master arm. The master arm being a really big one because it's, when you're flying by yourself in a multiplayer server and you want to toggle master arm on, you have to push that button, but you have no indication of what state it's in and you don't have a discrete up or down for it. All you have is a toggle. It's even worse when you get into things like having a flip down trigger, like I do on my VKB stick. And I use the flip down trigger as a master arm switch in everything. So when you flip the trigger up, it emits one button. When you flip it down, it emits a second button. And when you squeeze it, it emits a third button. So I use those first two buttons as master arm on and off, or off and on, I guess. And then the last one as my um, fire weapon or weapon release. And I can't do that here because there's no way to set it to be um, explicitly off or explicitly on. There's only a toggle. And so I end up having to flip the trigger down two times if I want to toggle it. So it's not ideal by any means. Um, there is thankfully a community mod that you can install. It's all linked in the description below that will give you these kinds of bindings and more that's missing or just not there. But this is at best a workaround. It's not really a permanent solution. Um, if, you're, if you had a friend who wanted to know where the binding for cargo hook was and you answered with, oh, well, you just have to go to GitHub and download these mods and get OVGME and then create this folder structure and then relaunch your game with the mods enabled and then you have to repeat that every single time the patches come along. That's a non-starter. It really, really is. Unless you're already one of those people who's running mods and has no issue getting more of them, that's a non-starter. You're not going to get anywhere with that. So this is a workaround. It is not a solution. We do need ED to prioritize some of these missing or in inadequate bindings. So next is the state of your AI operator companion, Petrovich, also known as he whose father's name is Peter, also known as a lover who gently fondles and caresses the loved one. Oh yeah, that's good. That's good. Very nice posture. Yes. Encouragement. So Petrovich, just like Jester before him, has a lot of potential to not just make solo flight possible in a multi-crew airframe, but to enhance it, to make it better, to make it more fun. And when Heepler first revealed Jester, it was like, 
wow, that's cool. He sounds awesome. He doesn't sound like a robot at all. He's got funny voice lines that not everybody likes. But it was great. It was really cool. It was like, I have this this sense here that I can interact with my Rio in the back seat in a very natural way just by speaking. Especially once combined with something like voice attack, Jester really comes to life and it's pretty cool giving him orders and then having him respond and just having like a conversation almost. So when it was revealed that Petrovich would not have voice lines for early access and they'd be coming at some point in the future, it was pretty disappointing, honestly. It was it really removed a lot of that wow factor, that impact of the uh, reveal. You know, Edie's been talking up the Petrovich AI for so long, talking about all the cool things that he'll be able to do, how he can fly the helicopter and everything else, and we were really excited for it, only to find out that he won't talk right away. So, besides the implications of just not being able to speak naturally to him, there's also the practical implication of you might miss the things he says because they only show up in a short-lived subtitle in the top left corner. And in VR in particular, they're out of your field of view half the time. So you might not even know. When it comes to something like asking him to turn on the weapon systems for the Sturm missiles, which takes three minutes, all you get is a little flash in the top left corner that, hey, he's done. No audio indication of any kind. And so if you're not looking there at the right time, you're going to miss it. And you're not going to know. So... It's not necessarily a great experience, and it makes him not so much fun to interact with. Now, there's another way that's not so fun to interact with him, and that's the menu. So, the menu is the main way you communicate with Petrovich, um, but it's a bit of a pain. In VR, it's plastered to the front of your view, and you can't move it out of the way. You can't just, like, bring it up and ignore it. It's not attached to the world. It's attached to your center of vision. And the bindings only work when it's up. So when it's blocking your view, you can tell him what to do. And then when you hide it again, you can't. So it would be nice if, for example, I could put that menu in the bottom left corner and like leave it, like the chat or the uh, controls overlay or one of those. If it was just another overlay attached to the world, I think that would be nice in VR. But it would also be nice if I could use his functionality without having to bring the menu up. So it would be nice, for example, to have bindings for the hook turn to um, leave or to slow down or speed up or change altitude or any of the other things that he can do. Right now we do have bindings for shoot, but that's about it. So if I want to, say, toggle his rules of engagement, I have to bring the menu up, I have to go to combat mode, and then I have to hold up long to change his rules of engagement. It would be nice if I could just bind it directly so I don't have to go through all the steps, or for more immersion, link it to a voice attack command so I can just tell him to hold his fire instead of having to push buttons. That would be really cool. Now to be fair, there's plenty of stuff that Jester can do that doesn't have direct bindings, and if you want to do voice attack with it, you either need the AI Rio plugin or you need to go and have it navigate the menu. But at least with the Jester wheel, that's doable, because if you hit A a second time, you get back to the, like the main menu, and it's a repeatable, predictable way to go through all of the different sections of said menu. With Petrovich's menu, it's not, because you don't know, or at least voice attack doesn't know, what mode it's in when you bring it up. So it has no idea whether it needs to switch from hover mode to flight mode or to combat mode or whatever before it issues a binding, or whether it's already in the correct mode for said binding. So I think this is a place where ED could potentially do better, um, where they could offer discrete bindings for everything that Petrovich does, and then you would have the freedom to bind it to extra buttons on your button boxes or your HOTAS, or to link it to voice attack and just have a more um, immersive conversation with your AI operator rather than pushing buttons for stuff. Now another thing is ED spent a lot of time talking about how awesome the AI operator was going to be, especially in regards to flight regimes. And then to find out that he can't take off at all, and he only lands by reducing altitude until you touch the ground, it was a little, uh, a little bit of a letdown, we'll say. I'm sure it'll come later, but it, it reduced the impact of that first reveal. You know, that wow factor of, holy crap, this is so cool. It's like, well, I don't know. I guess <laughs> it works. And at least so far, you also can't do stuff like tell him which way to turn after an attack run. When you do the hook turn, he just does a U-turn to the right no matter what. Which I found sort of funny after Wag spent half of a video explaining why he would always turn left because the visibility is better, and then the AI <laughs> proceeds to always turn right. Yeah. Um, 
and then I've been a little bit disappointed by his flying ability just in general because it, as you saw at the very beginning of this video it's pretty easy to have him turn around and then have him stop and enter VRS and drop out of the sky and kill you this, this can happen pretty easily he's um, not the most graceful of pilots and while I'm sure it's going to improve as time goes on it, uh, it really removes the appeal of jumping in the front seat and letting the AI fly the mission while I do stuff from the front. So it's just something, that, it's an aspect of this helicopter that could be really cool that I'm just not going to do <laughs> until the AI gets an upgrade and learns how to fly the helicopter a little better. Now, here's something that the AI does well. It's also not a good thing. <laughs> His aim with the Sturm missiles, the anti-tank guided missiles, is unreal. It is perfect. It is just rock solid stable. If you uh, pick a target, now there's also seemingly no order to those targets and he can't identify friend from foe so you have no idea whether you're attacking a friendly or a hostile, but when you pick a target he's gonna lock onto that target and no matter what you do, no matter how bumpy and awful your flying is, he's gonna keep the sight trained directly on that target and it kind of feels like cheating. So this is one that I'm sure will get worse as early access goes on, and that's better. But for now, I definitely feel like I'm cheating. From the other perspective, using the sight from the front cockpit is a little bit jank in 2D with this animation that sort of slides your face into the middle of the column of the periscope. I think I would honestly just prefer a fade to black over, like, phasing into the side of the column. In VR, however, it's considerably worse. So first of all, this little animation where you slide your head into the periscope violates the first rule of VR, which is to never hijack the camera. And secondly, it then doesn't black out the background like the 2D version does, and it kind of leaves you floating in the helicopter's sidewall just in inside the geometry and if you move your head around you can get all these lovely views of you know sticking your head down outside the helicopter to have a look at the sight doors for yourself which don't get me wrong there's a certain novelty to it but it's really not okay as is there is a patch note item that it's a work in progress that it will be improved so like I don't want to harp on it too much but it definitely does need to be improved particularly in VR Next, I need to talk about an issue that I'm potentially a little bit unreasonably upset about, and that's because it's been affecting me in the Mi 8 hip for almost seven months at this point, since December of 2020, uh, which is the first time that I became aware of it. So this bug has been reported on the forums in English and in Russian multiple times. Um, it's been acknowledged, they're aware of it, they know about it, and they've known about it since December. Um, and basically this bug is any external cargo that you pick up with a sling line behaves as if it has no weight. So I can be in an overloaded helicopter, I can be exceeding the maximum rate of takeoff weight already, and still pick up a 5,000 kilogram or 11,000 pound crate or box or fuel tank or whatever, and the helicopter will just pick it up as if it's not even there. It has no impact on flight performance whatsoever. And then it interacts yeah, weirdly with physics, or poorly, I should say, where it never really wants to settle down, where it swings around in circles by itself, where the line tends to snap, and it becomes very difficult to set the cargo down safely because it just doesn't behave properly. Uh, so this has been going on, like I said, since December. And in the hip, there are a couple of paid campaigns around sling loading, namely the crew campaign is a few missions with it, and the oil fields campaign is practically built around it. So I've had multiple reports from people in my videos saying that either they don't want to start these campaigns or they've had to stop them halfway through because they can't get through the sling loading missions due to the cargo weight bug. Okay, it's tight. Close up. Okay. All of that with just over two degrees of collective. It wasn't that heavy at all. It just kind of went straight up. So I made a point of reporting this to the community managers again back in May, just to say like, hey guys, um, this has been around for five months. I don't know if it's being worked on or not, but the hind is coming soon and it would really suck if the hind launched with the exact same bug. 
you know, it would be awesome if it could get fixed before the Heinz launch. I just wanted to, you know, raise that to their attention again, just in case it was something that had been deprioritized or overlooked or whatever. Sure enough, here we are, the hind is out, and it has the exact same bug. Any cargo that you sling under the hind, and it can sling load, it has no weight, it has no impact on the hind's performance. So I can get myself into this 113% maximum takeoff weight hind, overloaded that, you know, can barely lift off the ground on its own, and I can pick up that same 5,000 kilogram or 11,000 pound fuel tank or whatever, like it's not there. And that's not awesome. Now, to be entirely fair, we know sling loading is a work in progress in the hind. It has a known issue patch note that mentions that the voiceovers are work in progress, but not that sling loading itself is work in progress. Um, but it, we also know it has no bindings currently, so there's no manual hook or unhook binding. You just have the automatic ones. Um, so we know that sling loading is work in progress, but it still kind of sucks that this had launched like this. So naturally, I went and reported this to the devs to say, hey, like the hind launched and has the exact same bug that's been affecting the hips since December. Uh, and they told me they know. They're aware of it. Uh, it was reported during the hind's closed beta. And it turns out that they've had a couple of people working on it, trying to fix it, and they haven't been able to. And uh, once things kind of settle down, they're going to assign it to their senior flight model engineer to take a look at, because it has proved to be that difficult. Um, I think I'm just a little upset that that didn't make the patch notes, that they felt it was prudent to say that the voiceovers for sling loading are work in progress, but not to mention the bindings or the fact that the cargo has no weight and interacts weirdly with physics. Now I know most of you probably aren't planning on doing much if any sling loading in the hind, but I, have, I was really hoping it would be fixed so that there would be hope for it to be fixed in the hip. And Right now, I just don't have a lot of hope for that. So now we move into flight model. And as some of you have probably guessed, the flight model is of great interest to me. I don't really think anyone was too concerned about the flight model for the hind being poor or subpar or anything like that, based on the hip and the Huey and the Black Shark all being basically the gold standard for helicopter flight models in sort of the consumer flight sim space. And, you know, based on my limited testing with it so far, the hind is really no exception. The flight model feels largely complete. Um, I found very, very few issues so far, things where it doesn't quite match my expectations. Um, so I just really have a few smaller things to call out here just to highlight, and that's about it. By and large, the flight model has been excellent. So the first one is kind of that complete lack of feedback from transverse flow and from vortex ring state. Now, as you accelerate in a helicopter at around 30, uh, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour, somewhere in there, the helicopter should start to buffet and shake as it goes through transverse flow, and then eventually achieves effective translational lift. And the same the other way, as you slow down and lose effective translational lift, you go through this transverse flow and then enter a hover state. And during that state, where you're kind of halfway in between, the helicopter should shake and buff it and tell you that it's doing this. It's really, really obvious in the hip. I'm sure you've all seen it. It feels like the helicopter's shaking itself apart. And the same is true when you enter VRS. You know because it starts to shake like crazy and dash is moving all over the place. Uh, it's very obvious. Now, the hind is a little bit different. The hind doesn't give you that feedback. There's no buffeting, there's no shaking, there's no rattling, there's nothing. It's just smooth as glass as you accelerate, and again, smooth as glass as you decelerate. Now, at least according to Batlunet on Discord and her discussions with the developers, it does sound like the hind really doesn't give you a lot of warning. There really isn't a whole lot of buffeting and shaking, kind of like the hip. Uh, it's much more subtle. But I do interpret that as still more than nothing that we have right now. And from a comment on YouTube from Alexander here, saying that he can feel the feedback in SimShaker, he just can't see it, it does sort of lead me to believe that they just haven't done the animations and the sound work for it yet and that it's probably coming. 
Now the same goes in Vortex Ring State in the Hind, where I would expect it to buffet and shake and shudder even more than during Transverse Flow, and yet, as you can see, it's just smooth as glass, no feedback whatsoever that you've entered VRS. Again, I don't know how much is a realistic amount of feedback for the Hind, but my expectation is more than nothing at all. So the next thing I want to talk about is a potential bug with sideways flight in the hind. Now this was discovered by Eric Scott, who you might recognize as the engineer who did the video on the cyclic position in the Gazelle and how it doesn't really line up with the data for the real helicopter. So Eric in his first impressions video and then in a follow-up video identified that when the hind flies left, everything behaves largely as you'd expect. It wants to weather vane into the wind so that the tail spin uh, kicks out behind you and the nose points into the direction of travel. And so to maintain left sideways flight, you need a whole bunch of right anti-torque pedal to keep the nose in that out of trim, out of alignment configuration. Eventually you're going too fast, you can't do that anymore, and it will just naturally tend to point the nose left as it's doing there. And if you center the pedals, it will um, line itself up with a direction of travel and away you go. That's all well and good, um, but it doesn't work that way in right side flight as expected. In right side flight, um, it wants to weather vane the opposite way, to point the nose backwards and the tail into the direction of travel, which is not what we would expect. Uh, we would expect it to be just like left side flight where it wants to, it tends to nose into the direction of travel and you would need opposite pedal, so in this case left pedal, uh, to keep yourself pointed in that sideways configuration of the trim. But you can see here I'm using a whole ton of right pedal to keep myself in this configuration and that's just kind of backwards to what we'd expect. Now that could very well be correct for the hind, um, but if it is, I would love an explanation for it because I don't understand. It just doesn't meet what I would expect to happen based on my understanding of the concepts. Eric did take a guess at what he thinks might be going on here, and I think it's a reasonable guess, and if he's right about it, I'm very excited about it. Uh, basically, there's a concept called loss of tail rotor effectiveness. If you took your main rotor and just flipped it on its left side, made it smaller, and made it spin faster, that's your tail rotor. Uh, it's subject to all the same issues that your main rotor is, namely vortex ring state. Now, when you're flying left, it's like your tail rotor is climbing, and when you're flying right, it's like your tail rotor is descending. So in theory, if you're flying right fast enough, your tail rotor can fly through its own wash and enter its own vortex ring state, in which case you lose tail rotor authority um, and the tail rotor stops counteracting the effect of torque. So it's certainly reasonable that the nose would want to go left because that's the way the main transmission will torque it. But you've also got that giant vertical tail, which should cause it to weather vane the other way. So I'm not really sure what I would expect to see in that scenario. But it does line up with that guess that this could be the dev's early attempt at loss of tail rotor effectiveness. And if that is the case, that's very exciting and I'd love to know more about it. Now you can watch Eric's video. It's up here in the corner and linked down below in the description and I would highly encourage it. He goes into much more detail than I have here. So if you're interested to learn more, definitely check out his video on the topic. Now this one's kind of fun. This one has been driving me nuts since the hind came out because I couldn't quite pinpoint what was going on, whether it was just me or whether it was an actual bug of some kind and I was having a hard time reproducing it. But basically the return to center trim mode behaves like the default trim mode if you make a small enough correction. So as you can see here, when you're making a larger trim adjustment, such as setting your trim for takeoff, Center trim works fine. You push the button, the stick stays, the cyclic stays right where it's supposed to be, doesn't move, until I return my physical joystick back to its center. Now if I were to make a tiny adjustment and trim again, you see how every time I hit the trimmer, it, the stick moves just a little bit more? It's basically acting like default trimmer mode, where as soon as you hit the button, it updates those axis values and the cyclic moves. So in default mode, you need to get your controls back to center as quickly as possible to avoid that wobble or bump that you would experience. Return to center mode is supposed to be a solution to that. As soon as you hit trim, you lose cyclic authority until you recenter your physical controls. So the cyclic in your cockpit should stay put and shouldn't move or have that extra little bump. So it's supposed to be really good for making those little corrections. But when it behaves like this, it's behaving like it's in default mode and it I took me almost a week of flying it to figure out 
and to be able to reproduce this reliably. So naturally, right after I finish explaining to you that this bug only seems to impact small changes to trim, I had it happen to me on a much larger trim. Uh, this was my first one after takeoff, and as you can see, it basically tries to nose me into the ground. So I'm not entirely sure what's up with it, but trim is definitely weird right now. I want to talk now about mirrors. This is one of those working as intended, but I still don't like it topics. And if the hind isn't your first helicopter, then you probably already know what this is about. So have a look at where we are. We're here in Beirut, in Lebanon's largest and capital city, and it's densely packed with buildings and trees everywhere, as far as the eye can see. Now have a look at what's in the mirror. Nothing. Just a, a low res ground texture and a low res image in general for performance reasons, I'm sure, but we have no option to raise that and we never have. And it's exactly the same in the hind. It's not a big deal when you're in a jet, for example, because really, when do you need to see buildings and trees? If, as long as you can see other planes in the general contours of the Earth, you're good. But in a helicopter, especially if you're doing search and rescue type missions or whatever, and you're hovering at treetop height over top of buildings or somewhere else where there's obstacles around, and you want to be able to move backwards, your mirrors are useless to you. So I see this as an opportunity for improvement, not necessarily anything wrong with the hind, because it's been like this in every other helicopter in the game, but it's an opportunity where they could have made improvements. The ability to run higher resolution mirrors for systems that can handle it would be nice. The ability to turn on uh, scenery, so buildings and trees and power lines and other things that you can collide with and are likely to collide with in a helicopter at this altitude would be nice. It would be um, a real welcome change to be able to use the mirrors for something other than just some ambiance. If they're going to take a performance hit on your machine, they might as well serve a purpose, right? And at least as far as I'm concerned for helicopters right now, they really don't. Coming to the end of my list, there's a few things that I found significant enough to be worth mention, but not really requiring a whole lot in the way of discussion. So a few more things that are impacting the hind right now would include S5 rockets that always look empty, despite the fact that they're full and you can shoot them. S8 rockets that sometimes have performance issues when fired, and when it happens, at least for me, it's been pretty significant. The cannon only shoots from one barrel. The rearm and refuel menu doesn't give you any indication that the loadout you selected is invalid, nor does the ground crew try to stop you in any way. For example, they could refuse to arm the helicopter and use the same message they do in the hip when you try to arm uh, a helicopter that doesn't have any weapon pylons. There's this piece of the door piston that floats in midair. I didn't find it significant, but I found it, and I thought you guys might be interested to see what it looked like. So here it is. When you hide the seat and turn around to look into the cargo area of the helicopter or the troop area, it's pretty low res and blurry, like there's just nothing in there. And maybe they're planning to improve that in the future. Maybe that's just done for performance reasons and they have no intention of changing it. Either way, it would be cool to be able to look back there and see the actual cargo compartment. As mentioned several times by ED, the damage model isn't complete, but I was very curious to know just how simplistic it would be. Um, it's actually not that bad. It really isn't. You can shoot parts off the helicopter, the main rotor, the tail rotor, other bits. The wings come off. Uh, you get holes in the helicopter all over the place. Like, it's, it's really not bad for an initial damage model. It does feel a little bit like I can take more punishment than maybe I ought to be able to. Uh, so I wouldn't get too used to how durable you feel now. But it's not problematic, at least it hasn't been in my experience. 
Well, just like every other multi-crew aircraft in the game, you can't switch seats in multiplayer. Um, even if you're flying by yourself, you, you slot in and you're stuck in the back seat. You're flying with the AI, and that's all there is to it. Not unexpected, but a little disappointing. Um, we can do it in single player. We can hop back and forth at will. It would be nice if we could get over that limitation and be able to do the same thing in multiplayer. It's not such a big deal for the hind, because realistically you couldn't physically switch cockpits mid-flight. But it is a problem in the Huey right now, and it will be an even bigger problem in the Mi-8, if it ever comes to that one. And finally, the uh, APU runs a little anemic, and it has trouble starting the engines at or above 35 degrees Celsius, so if you're flying Persian Gulf, you might not be able to do a cold start right now. Well, that's pretty much everything I found significant in terms of things that are missing, incomplete, broken, or just otherwise disappointing in the hind. Now I want to be really clear that my overall impression of the hind has honestly been very positive. The modeling and texture work is beautiful, the sounds are immersive and convincing, and the flight model is exactly what you'd expect from the Bell Sim Tech guys who did the HIF and the Huey and the Black Shark. The multi-crew might have some issues right now, but it offers an almost unique kind of gameplay that really right now is only found in the Tomcat. And while the operator might have a little bit less to do than the Rio, it's still two people sharing one airframe. Your success is their success, your failure is their failure. There's no such thing as losing them in the merge, or meeting up with them later, or if they crash, you finish the mission by yourself, you're in it together. I think it's going to be really cool when they implement the gunners in the back, and you can actually have a full crew of people especially if they improve the gunning from what we currently have in the Huey, which is a little awkward to control. And credit to ED where it's due, um, the Hind launched in a pretty good state. It's largely feature complete, it's not causing crashes to desktop, people aren't rolling their game back or banning it from their servers. I mean, I know that's kind of like, that's just the basic expectation that modules should release in a state like that, but after the Viper's release, it's really nice to see that they took that feedback to heart and decided to bake this one a little bit longer before it came out, so I'm very happy to see that. And I hope it's a good indication for how the Apache will launch, because apparently that's coming out this year too. So lastly, I just wanted to quickly say that the free trial option is an awesome idea, and I encourage you all to use it. So I was able to wait for launch day. I did not pre-order the Hind. Um, and instead of having to wait for other people to give me their feedback and to put out videos and so on with their impressions, I was able to just activate a trial for the hind right from day one and then try it out for myself. Look for the things that I was interested in and not hope that other people would talk about those or have to wait for opinions on it. So I encourage you, if you haven't purchased the hind and you're on the fence about it or any module for that matter, give that trial a try because it's a great idea. It's good for business and it's good for consumers and it's rare to find something that's both of those things. So anyway, I'll be back with some tutorials for this thing in the near future and I'll catch you guys next time.